Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth session of the GSV Virtual Summit. I hope everyone is safe and hanging in there. Um, I went uh, downstairs this morning in full professional dress for the first time in a while, and my two-year-old daughter looked absolutely shocked and proclaimed, Mama is a princess, uh, which, which I was amused by. Um, today, we have a terrific lineup, starting with a panel of philanthropic leaders on the future of work, uh, which I'll be moderating. Um, followed by a panel moderated by Michael Moe on how big tech sees the future of digital education. And finally, a fireside chat with Deborah Quazzo and Jeb Bush. Um, so with that, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, our distinguished panelists for the first panel. Um, if I can welcome Dick George, the chairman, president, and CEO of Ascendium Education Group. Bill Hansen, the president and CEO of Strata Education Network. Jamie Marisotis, the president and CEO of Lumina Foundation, and finally Jeremy Wheaton, the president and CEO of ECMC Group. Welcome. Great. So to kick it off, I'd love it if, if each of you could uh, introduce your organization and share uh, who are the students that you're serving and what are your students experiencing right now? I really wanna ground the conversation in um, our students. And let's start uh, with you, Jamie. Right. So uh, first of all, thank you very much, Julia. And thank you to uh, you and to Deborah and Michael and all of your GSV colleagues for continuing to host these uh, important forums, um, and especially given our, our, our new reality. So you know, I want to say we're really privileged to be one of your partners in the shared mission of, of helping to uh, you know, I think get more people the education they need to succeed in the changing world that we face. And that's obviously, it's never been more important. Um, some of you know Lumina Foundation. For those of you who don't, we're a private foundation, meaning uh, in a technical sense, we're legally established as an endowment. So we have to spend a certain percentage of our assets every year on grants and other charitable purposes. So if you think about Lumina, uh, you can think about us in the same category as places like Ford Foundation or Kresge Foundation, Hewlett, et cetera. I wanted to mention this in part because philanthropy is really this rich and a broad term that includes private foundations like Lumina, community foundations, family foundations, corporate foundations. And it also includes a lot of other organizations like some of the great ones that are represented on this panel that aren't foundations in the same way that uh, Lumina is as a private foundation, but are very phil philanthropic in their aims and goals and uh, and are really uh, serving a very important public purpose. Um, I'm currently the chair of the Council on Foundations, a sort of national organization representing this, the sphere of philanthropy. And, you know, I, I'm called on a lot to talk about the evolving nature of philanthropy. And Lumina is a good illustration of how philanthropy is changing as we speak. You know, we're a quote unquote traditional private foundation, but we're doing something pretty non-traditional, which is we're aiming all of our work squarely at uh, trying to aim the country at achieving a specific national goal. We've done that by articulating this goal of 60% of Americans having a high quality degree, certificate, uh, industry certification, uh, or other credential by 2025. And we've tried to use a combination of our grant making uh, and frankly, our expertise and our influence to help uh, the nation get there. So you may be interested in knowing that since we established the goal in 2008, the country's actually increased attainment nationally from 38 to 48%. So that's good, that's real progress. But we obviously have a long way to go and COVID-19 is really threatening to set back that progress if we don't act uh, boldly. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, as an organization like my colleagues here on this panel, focus on meeting the rapidly changing societal need for talent because that talent can power economy and strengthen our democracy. Um, in particular, Luminous focus on eliminating equity gaps in educational attainment. Uh, we're, we're very focused on these issues related to, to race uh, because we think they've contributed to the growing disparities that I think we've, we've all seen play out in real time here uh, with the pandemic. You know, I think a lack of access to high quality learning opportunities after high school with the right kinds of academic and financial and, and other supports has really uh, denied Black, Latino, and American Indian people opportunities uh, to advance economically and fully participate in society. So, you know, you can see that at Lumina Express in our grant making. You can see that in the entrepreneurs and companies we invest in through our impact investing efforts. Um, you can see that in terms of how we hold ourselves publicly accountable through data and other information. Uh, last point, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues, is simply that um, 
you know, I want to underscore here, and I think we'll come back to this in our conversation, that I think our current crisis provides an opportunity to rethink how we bring education to a lot more Americans, including those who I mentioned have been have been left out. You know, at the end of the day, I think those of us in philanthropy, foundations like Lumina, we really have to maximize our endowments to serve society's needs. We have to take risks that maybe uh, others can't or won't. And uh, we have to serve as, as influencers and, and informers to meet the needs of those individuals who deserve uh, fairer and more just outcomes than the one they're achieving now. So thank you very much for the chance to be here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Bill? Well, thank you, Julian. <laughs> Again, thanks for having us. I know we would all rather be in uh, San Diego under uh, the normal uh, ASU GSB summits. But, um, and also, Jamie, thank you for uh, teeing this up. I thought that was <clears throat> very helpful. And I, again, I think all four organizations uh, on the call today are structured different, different missions, but all have, you know, a common purpose in uh, helping uh, uh, move the needle, uh, especially in the education to employment and uh, really the completion agenda. So really appreciate you know, the good work of uh, all of uh, uh, the leaders that are um, on this panel today. But, um, you know, just at Strata, we are, um, uh, a little bit different to where a, a public charity and uh, gives us maybe some different uh, structural um, approaches to things which uh, we've been able to try to leverage to you know again really uh, help um, uh, work towards what we're calling completion with a purpose and really trying to help uh, bridge the education to uh, employment gap and you know, we do this uh, through our national engagement activities, which includes uh, our philanthropy work, but also our, uh, the Institute for the Future of uh, Work, and, um, but also a lot of the work that we're doing at the, the state level. And um, one of the things that I uh, uh, might differentiate us a little bit is uh, we've been, uh, we had a joint venture with the Gallup organization for several years and have now launched our own Center for Consumer Insights, uh, which is, uh, uh, really the voice of the consumer, which I think is sometimes missing in all of the work that we're about and working with uh, policymakers and funders and uh, companies and others that are all uh, trying to solve uh, the challenges in our country, but uh, having the view of what really matters uh, to the, uh, the consumer, um, I think is critically important. Uh, we also, uh, as uh, the others on the call today, have really a um, I think a very uh, impactful social impact uh, uh, funding mechanism with our strategic investing. And uh, again, some, I think really terrific work with uh, uh, Deb and uh, Michael uh, uh, with um, uh, their work, but also with others on the phone and others on the call. And we also um, uh, have been really uh, 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 trying to also bring solutions to the table and uh, maybe we'll get to some of these uh, in the uh, later part of the conversation but uh, the companies such as education at work that provide internships uh, on uh, college campuses and uh, uh, job pathways to employers uh, mc which is an economic modeling uh, company and inside track uh, which are really in this uh, environment with college coaching uh, issues are more important than ever, but also Road Trip Nation uh, and Kale, which is the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, um, are all just incredibly important parts of our network. And uh, so really uh, for a little bit different where we try to get the combustibility of our uh, national engagement and philanthropy work, our investment work, but also operating uh, the companies that are in our network and getting uh, really hopefully the, the synergies and the combustible effect uh, to, to move the needle for our consumers. Thanks, Bill. And Jeremy? Thanks, Julia. I'll echo uh, Jamie and Bill's thanks to, to you and, and certainly to, to Deborah and Michael for holding this. It's, it's great to give us a voice and similar to Jamie and Bill, uh, yeah, we're all made a little bit uh, differently. Julia, nobody told me I was a princess this morning, so you're way ahead of me. <laughs> Uh, I'm going I'm to question my family and how I can be a prince each morning <laughs> I get up and go to work. But at, at ECMC Group, uh, we approach things a little bit differently, too. We've got uh, really a unique 
uh, education nonprofit stance uh, where we focus primarily on financial literacy and post-secondary career and technical education delivery. Uh, we actually have three career technical education uh, schools that we're really getting to see firsthand on the, on the front row uh, how COVID's impacting them. You know, we also have a lot of philanthropic work and impact investing similar to, to what Bill spoke about as well. And we do that through our different affiliates, ECMC, ECMC Education, ECMC Foundation, and then ECMC Group. And uh, holistically, as we look at things across all of our affiliates, our primary goal is to help students succeed. And, uh, you know, you asked who we're serving across all of our affiliates. Primarily, we're serving students who are uh, under-resourced and, and underserved, most times Pell eligible, first generation students. I, I'd say the new traditional student, right? The, the student who's got a family at home that's got a job uh, working and uh, you know, really how we're looking to serve them right now and, and with Lumina and, and Strata and Ascendium is uh, unless they're comfortable, unless they have food to eat, they have housing, um, they have mental wellness, uh, it's difficult for them to, to benefit. And, and this crisis has really highlighted that divide and uh, the need for, for what we're doing. Um, and I think what's been added now to those basic needs is internet access and devices and the tools to be able to do that. So as, as we've identified um, where we can do the best work right now, um, you know, it's really serving the 1,200 students that we serve at our, our career and technical schools, um, but through our grantees uh, and those that have uh, pipelines into the, the students who need this, it's really focusing on those basic needs and getting small grants immediately out to them uh, to ensure that they have the ability to, to benefit. Um, and all four of us here on the panel are, are working together on that, that pivot and getting the the money out there through our, our national post-secondary funders collaborative. So we've, you know, already put a couple of million dollars to work on that front. We've got a goal to get $9 million uh, in the hands of, of students and um, organizations that can immediately help folks. Um, you know, we've been able to flip all 1,200 of our students to a work from home inside of a, a week. Uh, and those are students, you know, 80% are students of color. Um, as I mentioned, 80% of them are getting Pell Grants and uh, are really focused on allied health and the skilled trades, which, uh, you know, we meet, need more than, than ever right now. So, um, you know, really, I'd say our, our early observations is that the work we're doing is, is helping people benefit and hopefully improve uh, their ability to earn a family uh, sustaining wage as, as we come out of COVID and, uh, you know, the 28 million dollars, 28 million jobs that are uh, short right now uh, come back online. Great. And I believe Dick is uh, audio only. Um, Dick, can you hear us? Yes, I can, Julia. Oh, Thank great. you. Great. Uh, unfortunately, as I'm apparently sheltering in place, I'm sheltering so well that my camera can't find me. Uh, not sure what the technical <laughs> difficulty is, but uh, so, so be it. Um, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, having me uh, join the panel. Uh, uh, I've, I've enjoyed the, the summit series virtually so far and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to make some contribution to folks who have tuned in today. Um, Ascendium Group is, uh, uh, as uh, Strata, we are a, a public charity and as such that uh, gives us some unique flexibilities. The uh, Ascendium Education Group of, uh, of, of nonprofit and for-profit companies is uh, a little bit unusual in that we are both a, uh, an operating company in the student loan space, uh, serving uh, millions of borrowers for over 50 years. Uh, and in addition to our operating companies, uh, uh, we are also a, uh, a large uh, philanthropy in the post-secondary space. Uh, all of our companies, both um, uh, uh, nonprofit and for-profit, uh, all of the companies dividend all of their net margins uh, to support uh, our philanthropic work. Uh, our philanthropic work is, uh, is focused on post-secondary access and success. And uh, we, uh, we measure success um, 
somewhat uh, differently than traditional post-secondary educations that look at, uh, at degree completion. Uh, completion is obviously important to us, uh, but we really measure success as the transition from education to work. And uh, as Bill uh, mentioned, uh, Strata's focus, uh, that's, that's a focus that we share directly. Uh, without a meaningful transition to, uh, to work, uh, there is no success for our, uh, our, our focus group of borrowers. And our, uh, our grant making is focused uh, primarily uh, on removing uh, systemic barriers faced by uh, learners, particularly from uh, low-income backgrounds. And uh, within uh, that uh, low-income background, we're focused primarily on historically underrepresented groups, uh, first-generation students, incarcerated adults, uh, rural community members, students of color, and veterans. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of work uh, uh, in our four focus areas of our philanthropy, uh, which include uh, removing systemic barriers to success, working with institutions to remove uh, 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 barriers that prevent uh, our target uh, demographic from succeeding at post-secondary education. Uh, our second focus area is streamlining transitions from education to work. Uh, and then uh, we have particular focus uh, on expanding high education uh, 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 education for the prison population in this country, which unfortunately on a per capita basis, uh, we have more people incarcerated in the United States uh, than any place in the world. Uh, it's a critical part of our uh, uh, labor uh, shortfall if we can't have that uh, population uh, educated uh, and meaningfully participating in the workforce uh, not only to uh, reduce uh, uh, re, uh, uh, you know, re-entry into the prison system itself, uh, reduce recidivism, but most importantly, producing millions of educated uh, uh, folks who can join the labor force. And then our fourth focus is uh, developing rural education and workforce training. Uh, for far too long, too much uh, of the philanthropy spend has been focused on uh, uh, urban uh, uh, areas. Uh, it's uh, it's reasonably reasonable to understand why that occurs. Most of the research organizations uh, are uh, urban uh, centered, uh, and those are uh, populations that uh, uh, meaningful programs can scale fairly easily. Uh, but the per capita spend for our rural communities uh, is, uh, is, is, is very, very uh, underfunded, uh, uh, and we see a, a very, very compelling need uh, to move more effort into rural education and transition to uh, meaningful work going forward. Uh, so uh, look forward to uh, uh, the discussion this morning, and again, I, I apologize for my effective sheltering. Great. Thanks, Dick. Um, Bill, uh, Strad has been leading weekly surveys on the sort of changing sentiment um, of work and, and school. Um, I, I'd love to hear some of the insights that you're gathering from those surveys. Well, Julia, thank you. And, um, you know, we've been uh, working uh, uh, on these developing these insights, but really about six weeks ago, uh, we started uh, giving a national uh, poll every week and uh, actually just about two hours ago, uh, put out our uh, latest um, uh, iteration and it's actually called Public Viewpoint and you can access it on our uh, website. All of this data is uh, publicly available, but you know, just the data that came out today um, indicates that 34% of Americans said if they were to lose their jobs, they would need more education. And um, the uh, other things that um, are coming out of this is those who feel that they need more education and training, 64% or almost two thirds would look for a job in a different career field. And obviously with uh, 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 approaching 30 million unemployed uh, individuals out there, this is uh, uh, potentially a massive 
undertaking for us. And, and I think a couple of the important considerations that are coming out of this is that we're, um, of those who are considering enrolling in the next six months, um, and this is uh, in addition to um, uh, our current uh, you know, fall enrollment process, more people are looking for non-degree programs. And, and of those who think they're gonna need more education or training, uh, the majority of those, 54%, um, are looking to online um, options. And um, uh, so, you know, in last week, our survey that came out actually really also heightened, uh, you know, we've been able to aggregate the data over the last uh, couple of weeks and to really show the disproportionate impact uh, that this is having on our minority populations and uh, especially uh, the African American and Hispanic uh, communities and just the increasing level of anxiety uh, for uh, those populations. And so you know, this is also where we're, you know, it's validating our approach of, um, you know, our uh, uh, thesis of who we're trying to serve are the four and a half million uh, disengaged youth uh, between uh, 16 and 24 years old. Um, also the 44 million working adults, and this is all pre-COVID of, of, you know, her earning individually less than 35,000 a year as a family less than 70,000 a year and who do not uh, have a, uh, anything beyond a, uh, or actually below an associate's degree and helping them get back on the upskilling uh, pathway. And then also even with our 20 million university students, uh, you know, I think our country and our systems have just failed miserably over the last 50 years you know, as the Pell study indicates of uh, the bottom two quartiles, um, you know, the needles have moved substantially for the top quartile and the second quartile, but for the third quartile and the bottom quartile, uh, uh, they barely moved. And so this is um, already, you know, the populations that were uh, most being left behind by our current system. And obviously, uh, you know, with this, uh, uh, the COVID situation and where we are right now, uh, uh, with the tens of millions of Americans being unemployed, it, it's just, uh, um, uh, again, heightening the uh, uh, compelling need we need to make to have systemic changes, or I'm calling an ecosystem change in our country to make sure that we're addressing all of these populations, but with a heightened focus on uh, those minority and disadvantaged populations. Thanks, so. Now, I think this is starting to get it at our, our big question, which is how we think the education system is going to evolve um, uh, in light of this crisis. And if we look at uh, like the 2008 recession, we saw enrollments jump uh, about 16 uh, percent, mostly flowing to community colleges. Um, uh, Jamie, do you think we're going to see something similar here? Um, and the provider landscape looks very, very different than it did in 2008, which was four years before even Coursera was founded. You know, how, how is it, where are students going to go? How is, how is it, uh, how is, how is it going to be shaped? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I want to underscore Bill's point here that, uh, again, not to be too stark about this, but <clears throat> COVID-19 mortality rates for African Americans are twice what they are for whites. So you just look at that single statistic and you come to recognize that the disparities here that we've long known by race, by income and many of these other factors are really being accentuated as a result of this crisis. So now you look at the sort of uh, broader impacts that you're talking about in terms of what happens to the, to the sector here. Probably should uh, remind everyone here that the pandemic hit just as we were already starting to see declining enrollment in higher education. So um, in 2019, there were 250,000 fewer students enrolled in higher education than there were the year before. And that's the sort of net result of both demographics, but also what I think we all recognize are the challenges with skyrocketing tuition and, and some other things. So, you know, we're not going to know until next year for, for certain what, what's going to happen, but it's pretty clear based on historic patterns here that, um, you know, what tends to happen in, in recessionary periods, and this one could drag on for quite a while, is that employers will become more selective in terms of who they hire because they can, because the talent pool is larger. Uh, and that means that individuals are going to have to up their skills. And uh, this is the point that I think uh, 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 Dick and, and Jeremy in particular were making that I, that I think is really important. So on the provider side, there's going to be winners and losers. Um, again, uh, even before coronavirus, 30% of the colleges tracked by Moody's uh, were running deficits. 15% uh, of public colleges and universities in the United States 
have less than uh, 90 days of operating cash on hand. Uh, Moody's ranked the whole sector uh, from stable to negative uh, just uh, last month. And uh, American Council mm -hmm. on Education, the, the umbrella group I mentioned earlier is saying that there's gonna be a decline over, of over $20 billion in revenues for higher education just in the coming academic year. So, you know, I think the biggest interest has to be on the regional institutions, on the minority serving colleges and universities, HBCUs, um, Hispanic serving institutions and tribal colleges, and the community colleges, because they're not gonna get the support that they need to, to build out their technology, to serve these critical populations that we're talking about and I think that they're gonna to need to build both new academic pathways, but also new student support pathways, which are gonna be so critical to the success of these students over the long term. Uh, Dick, Jamie, Jeremy, anything to add there? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, Julia, that uh, the digital divide is the other thing this is really highlighted, right? So you heard Bill say, and, and Jamie as well, that uh, more and more folks are going to need access to online education. So really focusing there and ensuring that the access that has really increased over the last 30 years or so uh, flows through into the, the online realm. Uh, before COVID-19, you know, trust that traditional four-year education was the, the right path for folks. All of those stats were, were headed down. The 18 to 22-year-old demographic is headed down and to the right. Uh, even our, our new traditional population uh, is plateauing. Uh, so there's gonna be uh, more demand, uh, but a, a pickier consumer from a student perspective. So how do you make sure that, that you're offering what folks need? Um, you've gotta be working with employers. To Jamie's point on uh, community colleges and states having the resources, the federal government having the resources, it's getting employers to engage and help you educate um, uh, employees the way they want to see them and uh, with what they need and and participating in that as well. So we, I know we'll talk about it more later, but we've seen a lot of success with that model, and we're seeing it persist through uh, through the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, and uh, I think it's just going to be important to to Bill's research so timely. Uh, only two hours ago, but had a chance to spin down through it. Uh, it's saying exactly what we're seeing, which is stackable credentials, a pathway. Uh, students just want to get back to work, but they also realize they've got to reskill so that when the next crisis hits, they're in the strongest position to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. As, as Jeremy mentioned, central to everything that everyone has been mentioned, mentioning is the employer and the role that the employer plays. Um, what collaborations have you seen between between uh, employers and your institutions, or what sort of collaborations are you seeing that 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 are working um, in bringing together uh, learning and work? Is that to me, Julia? Uh, that will be to let's see uh, to to Dick, and um, and then uh, we'll see who else wants to chime in. Cool. Yeah, let me uh, let me echo uh, what. Uh, what Jamie and, and, and Jeremy were saying about uh, what we expect in terms of uh, uh, the demand for additional uh, uh, reskilling and, and, and education. Clearly, we're going to see that, but it's going to be very, very different this time than it was after uh, the financial crisis. Uh, the advances in, in, in online education, digital learning, are so dramatically different uh, and the return on investment from traditional uh, post-secondary education is very, very different now uh, than it was after the last crisis. And I think what has to happen is we have to look at reskilling and additional education differently. It needs to be uh, faster, it needs to be cheaper, and it needs to be more directly uh, uh, intertwined with uh, the skills that employers are looking for. But as Jeremy mentioned, it, it depends in large part on what employers are going to do. And employers have traditionally used associate degrees and baccalaureate degrees as the filters uh, for employment. And employers need to change that. 
they need to look at stackable credentials. They need to look at compilation of uh, experience, uh, compilation of uh, skills, uh, all of which can be digitally transformed into synthetic degrees. Uh, but employers need to engage with this new form of learning uh, so that we see reskilling and education as shorter, less expensive, more directly meaningful to the skill sets that employers are looking for. And that's a, uh, that's a massive transformation of, of the workplace that's going to take uh, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of changes in public policy, but at the end of the day, it has to be employer driven uh, to recognize that the old filters uh, need to be supplemented by this new form of faster, cheaper, more meaningful learning. Jamie? Yeah, I just want to add to Dick's excellent point there, which is, and, and Bill and I have actually talked about this at, at varying points, which is that, look, there is this ecosystem, and there are lots of players in this ecosystem. Uh, the federal government is probably, because of COVID-19, going to have to play a more substantial role we know what's going to happen to state budgets. Uh, we know that that the resources available uh, to to increase the learning that we're talking about in states is going to be constrained. But the federal government's going to have to you know provide some sort of support there. But the thing we don't talk enough about is that employers are already a major player in this business, right? Employers spend five hundred billion dollars a year on employee education and training. And thinking about this ecosystem of where employers are making major investments. The, uh, uh, the federal government and states are making major investments and private capital markets have the opportunity to make more substantial investments than maybe they've made before because they have an opportunity to actually steer the system that some of the work that, that, that all of us, including GSV are participating in those kind of conversations is trying to direct capital to those who can actually uh, create this kind of change. I think that's the way we've got to be thinking about this. So I think this sort of idea that uh, we are that education needs to provide better service to employers is sort of an outdated notion. There's an ecosystem here where the employees and the employers are participating in a real-time labor market where skills expire much more rapidly. So, you know, the old, the old model of first you learn and then you work is really being changed by this ongoing learning model where employers, the federal government and others have to be working together in a sort of collaborative approach to increase the skill level, to target those equity gaps that all of us have been talking about in order to improve economic outcomes as well as the social outcomes that are so important. So can we talk a little bit about the, uh, the role of the federal and the state government uh, in enabling this ecosystem? You all have mentioned shorter form courses, these alternative credentials, uh, which are great, but are largely inaccessible if you, if you need Pell funding or um, other sources of, 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 of funding. So uh, what role should the state and uh, federal government play? I mean, there are calls for sort of massive reform pre-COVID. Um, and I think one of the questions is that Jamie and I talked about is, is this our GI Bill moment? Um, why or why not, and um, and what role should the government be playing? Julie, if I could, I, I just maybe to build off of what uh, Jamie and Dick just spoke to as well, and I think as much as we need the employers and uh, the government and institutions to be involved, I, I still believe that we also have to um, you know, have this uh, be a demand-based uh, approach, and just even a couple of things that we're learning, uh, you know, inside track or you know, coaching, Solution actually just uh, last month partnered with Futuro Health to help address the health worker shortage created by uh, COVID-19 and MC uh, also just um, they're actually helping the decision makers uh, to be better informed um, uh, of the displaced workers and also the aspiring learners in the near term and we've actually produced a free skills match tool and a free uh, resume optimizer and a job posting dashboard that tracks the economic um, uh, impact daily. And so I think that all of these um, areas, uh, again, um, you know, and a lot of us have been in the public policy realm, and I think to get to your current question, um, uh, it still has to be driven by, uh, you know, we are in such a different state now than we were 
you know, in 1965 or 72 when the Higher Education Act was you know, into place or the uh, things that were built upon it over the last uh, several decades. And the availability that we have of uh, data, um, student by student, uh, worker by worker, um, just, you know, we really need to change our obsolete systems uh, and turn them, actually get rid of them, <laughs> and frankly start over because, you know, the, the flow of the $180 billion of Title IV aid, the half a billion that uh, Jamie was talking about from the employer, uh, the state aid, um, you know, and, and again, we obviously need to support our current system as we know it, uh, uh, our higher education system, but uh, we have to create a system that doesn't just serve 20 million, but serves 30 or 40 million individuals. And that next 10 or 20 million of individuals are going to be these 44 million working adults who don't have access uh, uh, to the uh, opportunities of uh, learning and upskilling, much less uh, the you know, 26, 27 million uh, unemployed. And so, you know, and again, I... Um, just think that uh, this is an opportunity, you know, as, of, you know, uh, again, the necessity is the mother of invention and crisis is the mother of uh, innovation and we are there. And it is gonna take us several years to uh, get back to any sense of normalcy and a lot of the work that we are doing pre-COVID with, uh, uh, with employers, um, you know, right now it's just getting people back to work and getting our students back to school. And so we're gonna be in this you know, kind of rescue and recovery effort, but that's got to lead directly into the innovation and impact uh, realm that we're uh, looking to come out of this. So just like we did, uh, um, you know, either after the uh, the GI Bill or the you know the recession of uh, over a decade ago. And Jamie, can you share some some bright spots? Because you 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 have some examples where you've partnered with employers where where you're seeing actually a lot of success. Um, working um, with with vulnerable populations, can you can you share um, some bright spots here? Sure, Yvette, and uh, I will say, Julie, be, before we kind of leave this point, uh, Jamie alluded to there's there's billions of dollars on the sidelines ready to to come into the marketplace, and I think one place uh, through uh, through the crisis here that that's been great on the state, federal, and accreditor side of things is the increased flexibility given to institutions to adapt to the current environment. So it, just as we look forward, it doesn't take any money to give folks more flexibility, of course, with the appropriate checks and balances to ensure the ef efficacy of, of the teaching and the things that are getting done. But you know, extending out the ability for institutions to share and get approval on an expedited basis to be able to, to deliver their curriculum uh, from a distance to use different uh, lab and uh, competency techniques to be able to to confirm that the learning has occurred even if it hasn't been in a traditional sense within within the labs within the classroom and and that's a good segue for me into you know something that we started <clears throat> back in 2018 uh, which is really closely partnering on the HVAC front in the Atlanta marketplace um, to build out a new lab but to engage uh, regional and national HVAC leaders in, uh, in the development of that curriculum and have them involved uh, in the classroom. And they're, they're still there today. They're, they're attending via Zoom. They're using their materials, their, their settings uh, to, uh, to help us uh, move through different HVAC problems. Um, but what we've seen through that is an increased engagement, even as we've gone to distance learning. Uh, in our student body. So even though we're 100% online and we'll need to check some competencies that we're not able to do from a distance when we get back into the office place, uh, we've seen really high levels of retention, uh, even higher than we saw in the classroom. Our attendance has been very positive. The belief that they can be successful online um, has, uh, is, has been, been surveying weekly, has been in the mid 90s. Um, so the satisfaction levels, the attendance, uh, the attendance, the outcomes has been very positive. And, and I attribute that to what we started uh, with our HVAC employers, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, that they're in the classroom referring to the students, you know, really as their employees and excited about developing things. The other thing that we saw from that is an increase in their, their pay rates. So we recognize that we were graduating 
uh, students maybe at uh, stage one, stage two on the pay grade, but if we augmented the curriculum just a touch, they could come out and be at a stage three and make a couple of dollars more an hour, which is, is hugely impactful uh, when you're talking about this level. So um, for us, uh, I think there's, there's a increased belief that even on the career and technical age, education front, um, that we can utilize technology, that we can use uh, at a distance and work from home, which limits the cost of the delivery of the program uh, while increasing the efficacy and the employability of our at-risk population. Great. So uh, a, a final question is, as, as we sit right here, what makes you optimistic about the future of post-secondary education? Um, and if you each could take just one minute, um, starting with Dick. Yeah, I think uh, what makes me most optimistic is that the uh, the pandemic is is actually accelerating the uh, the necessity of reform in post secondary education. Uh, I I think we're seeing that uh, across the board in in many different spaces. Um, you know, as we look at uh, uh, changes in the way developmental education is taught, uh, the emergence of open educational resources. Um, the willingness to move away from single high stakes tests to place students in courses. Uh, all of these reforms uh, backed by uh, evidence, uh, you know, clearly demonstrate that equity gaps uh, are in fact closable, that uh, post-secondary education can change. Uh, but, you know, to go back to the question about uh, state and local and federal government uh, input, uh, all of the philanthropic money in the world isn't going to be able to change uh, this quickly enough without effective use of federal, state, and local monies. And one of the things that we see repeatedly is that there are far too many state programs uh, where the dollars that are offered to support post-secondary education are done on a first-come, first-served basis without any metrics or data analysis of what the outcomes are. Uh, and so I think we need to focus on that. We need to focus on acceleration of reforms that are already in place. Uh, but I'm optimistic that this all can be done. And I think the pandemic is going to uh, uh, give us real cause uh, to look much more uh, uh, focused on these changes and move them forward. Great. 30 seconds from, from Bill. I would agree, Dick. And just uh, again, you know, I uh, feel like the unprecedented amounts of uh, also aid uh, that is coming out of uh, Washington with the stimulus uh, packages. And again, a lot of this is just going to be to help on the rescue and the recovery efforts. But I think it is really an opportunity to um, uh, also start putting into place the innovations that are going to be. Uh, really good point. And I, I think there was a, an appetite for this before uh, COVID-19 hit. And I think in many ways, this is again, just going to accelerate uh, the opportunity uh, for us to really make some very, very fundamental changes. And, and again, I believe technology and you know, a demand-based system uh, is going to uh, require uh, us to you know, create the systemic changes that we're going to need to make sure we're supporting our uh, families and learners going forward. Jamie? Yeah, I just, I've got a new book coming out in the fall called Human Work in the Age of Smart Machines. So I think you sort of know my view of, uh, we, uh, we clearly are, are at a moment where we've actually got to prepare people for the significant change that's coming as a result of technology. So let me just say quickly, I'm optimistic. I think Dick's right that necessity is going to force change. The only point I'll add to what Bill and Dick said is, you know, in the Great Recession, government allocated resources to essentially keep the current system going. But now I think government's gonna to have to allocate resources to fuel change, to keep the best parts of that system going, but to prepare people for this human work of the future. And I think this crisis is gonna force a change that we inevitably had to go through, that we missed the opportunity on in 2008 and 2010, but for which we have no choice today. Jeremy? Yeah, I certainly agree with uh, Dick's 
points on this being a tipping point and the acceleration. So I won't repeat uh, Jamie, Bill and, and Dick's commentary there. I will say I'm excited for the work ECMC uh, Foundation has, has done over the last couple of years, in putting in the infrastructure to have 600 fellows over the next few years in the field working on CTE leadership uh, collaborative and uh, really working to take advantage of, of this acceleration that we're coming out of. Getting those folks, I think, out into the field and the infrastructure in place to be able to learn from what's happening and share those learnings and the research as well as uh, getting more CTE leadership in the field and media to cover it. Uh, is going to be a real positive for us, that if, uh, if not for the, the work of that team uh, and our board over the last couple of years, uh, wouldn't have been positioned to, uh, to, uh, to work through this. So I appreciate that. Okay, well, well, thank all of you. Thank you for being on this panel and um, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Julia. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michael Moe for our next panel. And I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. You said, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for that terrific panel. And I'm very excited uh, for our next uh, a panel that uh, is Tech Superstars' view on the future of digital learning. Um, should be a lot of fun. Before we get kicked off with our, with, <clears throat> with our different panelists, I want to remind everybody tomorrow we have a special episode of the Summit Series where it's our privilege to have Dr. Michael Crow, President of Arizona State University, with us. We're going to be doing that at 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern and 11 o'clock uh, Greenwich time uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon and evening. As people know, Dr. Crow uh, has uh, been listed as Time Magazine's one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Arizona State is the largest public university in the United States and for the last five years in a row has been voted by US News and World Report as the most innovative university in the United States. It also has been ranked as the number one organization in the United States for sustainability efforts um, consistent with the UN's goals. And uh, should be just an absolute uh, fascinating session. Again, starting at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And so now I just wanted to introduce my uh, panelists from our tech su superstars. First, Stephen Bucci, head of education at Google, Google Cloud. Michael King, VP and General Manager at Global uh, Education at IBM. Andrew Coe, Global Director of Education and Workforce at AWS, Amazon. Our old friend Jessica Lindell, VP of Global Education at Unity. And then Anthony Salcido, who people know Anthony for a long time as the VP of Education at Microsoft, which he still is, but he's also the interim uh, Vice President for public sector and government at Microsoft as well. And so just to put some context behind this um, as it relates to the uh, panel and how important technology is, just 10 years ago, Google had a market cap of around $100 billion. Today, it's $875 billion. Amazon had a market cap of just $25 billion. Today, it's $1.2 trillion and Microsoft had a market cap of about $175 billion. It's now $1.3 trillion. And if you look at the five largest technology companies in the world, and we have four on this panel, it's uh, approximately 20% of the S&P 500. So in other words, five companies alone are 20% of the S&P 500 value. So just incredible influence technology has in society and overall business. And we're excited about the influence and impact that technology we believe is going to have in the digital learning space as we look ahead. So just to kick off the panel, what I'd like to ask first is just as it relates to, um, you know, as it relates to uh, this crisis that we were, we've been in with Corona, what have you learned during the crisis? And maybe I'll give that to Anthony first and we'll kind of go around the horn. 
Thanks, Michael. And certainly uh, we've learned a lot. And one of the good things about this journey is we're dealing with it globally and we're learning quickly um, from both exemplars and challenges that we're facing. Uh, I think I was surprised by the lack of readiness uh, institutions had to remote learning as a concept. Uh, many faculty were under uh, prepared to uh, embrace these tools and modalities. And the initial phase, and still in many cases has been the phase, has been a translation to digital classrooms. So taking lectures and experiences that would happen in, in a traditional setting and move them online versus thinking more holistically about a digital canvas of asynchronous blended modalities more naturally. So I think there's still progress to be made there, uh, but we're learning from, uh, from uh, best practices and examples every single day and getting smarter as a company and getting smarter to support uh, tools for, for, for educators and learners. Thank you. Jessica. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having us. I just wanted to give a shout out to you guys as well. We've, uh, our team has been on most of these sessions. It's just really brought our community together. So thanks for, for all your effort in doing these. Um, so I, as everyone knows, Unity is a, a little bit earlier stage than my peers on, on this panel. And as a result of that, we have the opportunity um, to have a really broad view of education. And so I'm just going to dive into the four different areas that we're supporting and give our key learning there. And I'll just do that in a few minutes because I could spend the whole call doing that. Um, so the first area that we manage is the work in all of our global schools, middle schools, high schools, universities, advanced degrees. I think the key learning that we had during this crisis was we've got to support our educators even more. Um, specifically, educators who were technically savvy already teaching Unity in real time 3D. They wanted us to jump in and deliver that live virtual training for them, which we, which we did and we've had amazing experiences and responses. Educators from the hardest hit areas of the world. Um, obviously, we started this off in China in January, Italy, our own country here in the US. Um, the gratitude and the community building that's happening globally as a result of that live virtual training has been significant. The second area that we focus on um, is we have a, a huge global community of self-paced uh, learners who are either hobbyists wanting to create their own video games, their real-time 3D, or they are aspiring professionals wanting to reskill and upskill. And what we've seen, you know, not as, uh, not dissimilar to Coursera's numbers that we saw is just a massive increase in the amount of those learners wanting to upskill and reskill and an ask, which is Unity, can you go broader in the work that you're doing and helping us get into these jobs and teach skills outside of the Unity platform? So you'll see announcements coming from us that are gonna be a, a broader set of partnerships with uh, traditional universities and alternative programs to get broader jobs. The third area that we handle is all of the enterprise uh, corporate training, uh, that $500 billion number that is so staggering on how we reskill um, all of our employers and our customers. And uh, what we've seen during this time is just a significant ask for keep this live learning going that you used to deliver to us in person, deliver it virtually and as a result, we're building community in our companies that are no longer able to work in person together. And so we all know that learning together builds community, but that's been a really exciting result. And then finally, as everyone knows, thousands of real-time experiences are built on the, the Unity platform. And uh, we're all familiar with this, this commentary of you know, software eating the world. What we like to think is that learning is fueling the world. So again, every, every opportunity that's created on Unity for real-time 3D, massive increase in use across all industries and, and fields of study. Yeah, I think learning fueling the world is a great uh, framework for sure. Michael, what have you guys learned during the crisis? Well, I think uh, what we have learned is that technology has been kind of a nice to have in classrooms and that uh, for a lot of of the institutions that we work with, uh, as Anthony said, many of them simply weren't prepared for this. Uh, at the other extreme, I think we've had some institutions that really were quite prepared. Uh, for example, I have a, a school system that had been implementing digital learning days for many years, actually practicing this to send kids home uh, to uh, keep the lessons going. And what I think we have seen is that technology is a critical enabler, but there's a lot 
that has, has to go around this from teacher training to leadership training uh, to really looking at how you transform the entire educational experience to leverage technology. So I think coming out of this, we're going to see a lot more uh, focus on how do we really use technology not as a tool uh, for individual teachers, but how do we systemically use technology across education in a way that can ensure that learning keeps happening regardless of where the student is and that we can ensure that uh, those learners are progressing to where we want them to be. Awesome. And what do you learn? Uh, Michael, I think we at, at Amazon Web Service just learned an incredible amount. But before I even begin there, I, I want to first take this opportunity and really thank a lot of the, uh, the educators out there. Uh, I mean, I think this clearly are unprecedented times. We ourselves as individuals are trying to learn ourselves how to work from home and, and really collaborate and be effective and take care of our own young ones in the family. And at the same time, the educators have to do uh, their own uh, personal, uh, we'll call it adaption uh, or adoption to this new environment, while also taking care of our own uh, learners. So I want to just make sure that uh, I want to just personally recognize a lot of those educators who are working extremely hard to get all of the uh, folks to continuously learn. Thank you. Uh, two okay. things, yeah, there are two things I'd just like to say. I think it's very common. Yes, we also recognize that a lot of folks were, were not prepared, uh, even, even those that were prepared. Uh, there were some small gaps that also needed to be covered. For us, uh, I'd say uh, it was just almost back to basics. Do they have the right infrastructure? Will this thing scale? Our customers, our universities, institutions, technology companies, publishers, uh, and even, uh, well, of course, the K-12, but we were being approached by governments, ministers of education. How do I keep everything of all the hundreds of thousands of learners in Bahrain through the Minister of Education or in Brazil, the million, where they were not ever designed or thought to even scale all at the same time around the world, uh, have you, uh, of really having everybody scale and have that level of performance. And that was one of those things that we all really wanted to assist uh, all of those customers at, at, in a very uh, simplified way. Um, and getting to that basic thing, where, where do they have connectivity? Do they have devices? It was not surprising, but there was a lot of challenges of even understanding that and, and how many of those students or those learners or those homes had even access to even turn anything on, forget it, even getting to the technology. Um, Anthony mentioned also educators as well as um, Jessica. I completely agree. I think there's a, a great amount of evangelists who really get the technology. Um, we recognize that there were a vast majority of them did not know how to leverage it. Uh, and so part of, part of the thing that we launched, was we had actually close to a thousand educator volunteers to just go up there and just be there through webinars of basic things like, how do I manage a classroom online? Uh, so it was really good. And the lesson that we learned is educators just like to talk to educators. They don't want to talk to myself or a technologist. And there was a certain level of comfort. Uh, and as such, just within several weeks, we had over 14 to 15,000 people participate um, across those webinars. So those are the type of things that we saw um, specifically that we were, we'll call it lessons learned uh, during this crisis. And now I think as we start to hopefully move out of the crisis into a recovery or improvement mode, we're seeing some new innovations occur as well. Great, Stephen. Thank you for having me and, and agree with Andrew. Thank you to all of our educators out there, especially adapting to this crisis. I think the two things we've learned, the first is the amount of resilience. It, in, in light of this really quick pivot, and I think the last panel was talking about how this has forced some people to move probably faster than they've been wanting to, we've seen it in the numbers. The fact that Google Classroom in just the past few months doubled in active usage to 100 million users, like that's pretty unprecedented. And it shows the resilience of people adapting to this new normal of what it is now. The second thing that I think we've learned as well is how much opportunity there is in data-driven decisions. I was reading an article in the New York Times by Dr. Christina Paxson from Brown University. And she was mentioning as schools start to come back in the university side in the fall, there's so much data needed around contact tracing, around how's our population, what's the infection rate in our population. I think that creates a big opportunity for both universities, higher education, and uh, technology to, uh, providers to come together and, and provide tools and uh, around that need. Great, thank you. Uh, and I asked the panelists, because we do have five of you and there's so much to wanna cover, if we could keep our answers as 
tight as possible. I love interaction between, if you, if you want to jump in, please, please do. Also want to remind the audience, we'll be taking questions. So go to the question uh, uh, tab and you know, we'd be delighted to, 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 to uh, provide the questions to our, to our various state panel. So uh, question, on a one to 10, one being bad or one being not important, 10 being extraordinarily important, how important is education to, um, to your company's uh, future? I'm gonna start with Michael King. So, you know, Michael, I go back to a book that you wrote many years ago called The Book of Knowledge, I think, which started me and, and us on a path around looking at education, not just as, as schools and universities. I apologize for that. But my long, my long learning, right? And, and, and you've been on this theme for a while, as have we, right? So the P-TECH program that we launched was about connecting high schools to college to career. We've got uh, well over 200 of these P-TECHs around the globe now, other employers sponsoring those. So as I think about uh, education for IBM, it's critically important. We um, are both a major employer and have to train not just our own employees, but business partners and clients. We have uh, our foundation and a lot of our corporate investments are geared around what we call IBM skills, which are uh, major investments like P-TECH to try to develop skills across the globe and to address some of the impact that technology is gonna have uh, on learning. And so our business as well is critically important. So how, how we can uh, build the solutions and capability to help people across both the education domain, but as well as uh, the workforce domain and bringing those together. And so I think that's uh, very important to us as a company. So 10. Yeah. Good. Anthony. I don't think anyone's not going to say 10. Uh, I'll just give you two examples from Microsoft. Uh, in our mission and in our acquisitions, uh, certainly our mission to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. I think that focus is aligned very well to the mission of education systems globally. Um, our new CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, made really three big acquisitions all related to this specific issue. The first one he did as CEO was Minecraft with the acquisition of Mojang, which is really in many ways the first pathway we have in schools to help students learn to code, get excited about using technology to make and create, uh, and then build purposeful skills on their way to employment, uh, which was connected to obviously our acquisition of LinkedIn, bringing this path from schools to career uh, more holistically focused. That's gonna be an even greater need for society as we go forward and, and deal with the um, economic uh, backlash of what's going on in, uh, in, in, in societies globally. And then obviously GitHub to enable tech careers and tech sharing and collaboration uh, to be core. And certainly the role of preparing students in university with, with skills that will be certainly needed in the workplace, as well as uh, aligning their talents to solve challenges with technology, whether it's uh, accessing huge data sets with quantum computing and cloud uh, to help with the future uh, uh, virus protection that we're gonna have in, uh, in, in need for. I think there's gonna be a huge catalyst and it's really reflected in Microsoft's, uh, not only the work we do every day in schools and universities, but the, the foundation of what we've been doing as a company strategically. Great, and I'm gonna come back to LinkedIn in a little bit if we get a chance. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think anybody's going to say below a 10. Uh, yeah, for us here at Amazon Web Services, and clearly at Amazon, education is extremely important. We have over hundreds of millions of students, parents, educators in over 200 countries and territories leveraging our technologies. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, we've been in the cloud for over 13 years. And one of the early adopters uh, of cloud uh, was actually researchers in education. They were the ones um, that were there early adopting, saw the value of it. And now as we start to see that cloud is now becoming more of a core fabric really to allow for a lot of these applications <laughs> and institutions to really connect together, be scalable, and then now really drive a lot of innovation through a lot of the machine learning that's also occurring. Um, as a part of that overall philosophy uh, to really help our customers specifically in education, we've had this longstanding program called AWS Educate and through Educate, we offer really a tremendous amount of modules for individuals to learn, you know, what it is like to, to have a career in, uh, in the cloud uh, or a cloud job type of career pathways. And that, which you call Educate program has also now created a tremendous amount of partnerships, community colleges. It's actually been now part of many community colleges, their actual degree program 
which actually became a very, very beneficial thing for this online that we can talk a little bit uh, later with. And that is now really creating a flywheel for not just allowing yeah. individuals to learn new skills where we consider a lot of high skills that are in demand today, probably much more so after this crisis. And we are also not connecting just with certifications, but with real jobs, jobs with us, uh, jobs with other companies. Uh, we today have over tens of thousands of technical jobs that are unfulfilled today. And so that entirely um, is not just to feed us, but many of our partners and our customers out there with that similar demand. So education is not just a business, but something that we believe that we can really improve, upskill a lot of the individuals out there, whether you're in high school, community college, or even four-year university folks. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, as many of you probably know, Google is actually born out of a research project at a university. So it's pretty important to us as well. And I would say on two components, I think one from a product perspective, of how can we help educators, universities, K-12, et cetera, bring things like Chromebooks into the classroom, bring things like cloud computing. But secondly, as well as I think that for Google, we're thinking about creating partnerships. And so we work with hundreds of educational technology companies regarding integrations and how do we make that full experience because just putting technology in the classroom does not solve problems. So how do we think about it holistically and make sure it's easy to use? And then obviously like the others mentioned as well, really education is the future of our company, their company, uh, all the leaders. So we need to make sure we're developing the right skills as they progress their educational careers. Great. And Jessica, you, you touched about how important it is and fundamental what to what Unity is doing. Maybe you could expand upon how you see the role of gaming um, helping people learn. We call it invisible learning. I, I love that, you know, obviously Microsoft is huge in gaming and Amazon is huge in gaming. And I'd love to get all the perspective, but maybe you could talk about how you think about um, the opportunity to, to, to help people learn things through games and this concept of invisible learning. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, uh, I've been in this uh, for about 10 years. I started off um, trying to tackle it from how do we bring game-based learning into the classroom? And frankly, uh, the challenges of uh, the systems in place to be able to make that work at scale were too difficult for us to be able to make an impact at scale, which deliberately uh, forced me personally to want to move into the gaming space. Um, as we all know, kids on average uh, defined as you know, 10 to 18 are spending an average about five hours a day playing video games around the world. It is significant. Um, and we all know anecdotally uh, from Minecraft, as Anthony mentioned, you know, all the way up to Civ, uh, how much one can learn from a game-based experience. And so similar to what I said before, we think of learning as infused in every single game experience and really the game mechanics almost aligned with instructional design to deliver a strong learning outcome. Yeah. Anthony, what, what do you, how does Microsoft think about gaming converging with learning and what do you think the opportunity of the future could be? Yeah, I, first I think there's gamification, which certainly is, is certainly hugely valuable in terms of incentivizing. We've built that into our certification platform, Microsoft Learn, which provides open courseware for students to get job ready. And we put gamification elements there uh, that's helpful. Game-based learning, actually, with Minecraft, we've added both chemistry add-ins to let students learn how to understand chemical compositions, a code-based language inside of Minecraft to learn to do uh, uh, block editing or uh, um, uh, visual, uh, you know, JavaScript coding inside of the game, uh, using even plugins like Scratch, where you can actually use uh, Scratch right inside of Minecraft. Getting students to think about technology as a tool for creation, uh, whether it's using data to actually come to conclusions, uh, using technology to express their ideas, that's the shift that we need to make. What, what helps with game-based learning is you can start to do that very young, where students and young learners don't think of technology as just a consumptive tool or a tool to do basic collaboration and productivity, but a tool that you can actually express things that weren't possible without technology as a tool. That's the thing that we've got to start very early uh, as we, as we uh, you know, drive a, a new thinking for learners and a new embrace of technology. Uh, the COVID-19 response is helping where schools who were using technology for note-taking or basic collaboration 
and communication are now thinking differently about how they can do project-based learning, how they can think differently about using uh, multimodal learning, uh, learning opportunities. We've got to reflect that with our technology platforms, and we've been seeing that with both integration of tools like Teams and the full stack of Microsoft productivity experiences. But really, providing more flexibility uh, is going to be important. I'm a big gamer myself, actually, uh, and uh, it's helped me both with problem solving, um, being able to differently about the language as, as um, uh, games do. Jessica mentioned this sort of design of the game-based rules that creates a new learning pathway. Uh, and that's something that I think research has shown I'm a big supporter of and, and certainly Microsoft is pursuing. Yeah, we're, we're big believers that the game is going to help really transform the learning experience and it's going to play a major role. Um, as we talk about artificial intelligence, and you know, it's basically here. I mean, I, we, we've been waiting and hoping for a long time, but you start to see its impact in society and business and education. Uh, IBM with Watson, Michael, you guys were a pioneer and you guys were very uh, generous with us, both in terms of the support of the ASU GSV Summit and Watson, but also, you know, uh, opening up your research, if you will, to, to helping us understand what Watson was doing. How do you see, where do you see artificial intelligence today as it relates to learning and, um, and how do you see it in the future? What have we learned? And I think everybody on this, everybody on this call can I, you know, participate, but I'm gonna first give it to Michael. What, 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 what do we know from, learn, what, what do we learn from Watson? Well, I think we've learned a lot. And first of all, this has been one of the technologies that scaled the fastest of any I've ever seen in my career. Uh, you know, it was hard to almost keep up with the state of technology as we were building tools, things were moving so fast. What I've seen happen is, is that you know, Watson's really proliferated everywhere. It's in every corner of the tech, of, of technology that we develop, and we've really seen it across the market. Um, we've got hundreds and hundreds of companies now that are using Watson within Watson API services within their applications and their, and their content. Um, just looked at a, a small startup that's using Watson text-to-speech for a, a CDC training tool. Um, meeting this week with a company that's uh, using Watson uh, services to translate uh, legal content across the globe. So we really seeded it and it's pretty broadly used now across the marketplace. Uh, I think one of the things that we learned from uh, the experience, not just in, in education, but particularly in education though, is that AI is very much a big data tool. And a lot of institutions, whether in schools or in higher education, I've never had a, a really strong data strategy. And so one of the things that, uh, two things we've done now is to shift toward a greater emphasis on how we build uh, the data infrastructure for learning. Uh, if you think about whether it's game content or anything, I've got a school district, for example, that has uh, 341 digital learning tools in use across their classroom. So how do we pull data from that to be able to use it for things like career coaches and things where maybe we're looking at longitudinal experiences for students um, that, that span multiple courses. So we're doing a lot of work now around how do you build that data infrastructure. Uh, we're working with, um, uh, as you know, the Department of Commerce actually has issued a recent paper uh, talking about interoperable learner records. And so we think there's a, a really powerful opportunity to begin looking at standardized uh, data platforms, kind of this uh, learner record that would persist with you over time. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work there. And we've also uh, really started work with uh, building out a whole new set of Watson uh, services using some of the existing uh, talent technology we have with Watson to build a, a, a new framework for talent across the entire life cycle. Wow. Andrew. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, this has been, I guess, one of those silver linings and some of those, uh, we'll call it the challenges that we've seen so far. Uh, and, but just take even a step back, uh, machine learning has been something very core to us for almost 20 years. Many of you recognize all the recommendation engines on our .com or even the robotics that are in our warehouse uh, or even the drones. Those are all driven and being created when it comes to machine learning. And we, in education, even prior to COVID, we're finding a tremendous amount of those education technology companies truly adopt machine learning within their actual offerings. And just one of the quick examples top of my head was uh, Santiana, uh, one of the large publishers out there uh, based in, in Spain, uh, wanted to help and assist educators grade papers. Uh, in certain countries or certain educators are spending many, many hours 
with these national exams, especially the ones that are text written. So machine learning application would actually be able to read that text and provide an assessment of that particular student's written uh, part of the examination. That ultimately was one of the huge benefactors of using some very intelligent type of machine learning technology for something very basic for an educator to save time. Now, during this COVID crisis, um, many of you may or may not know, but um, my boss, as well as our organization at Amazon, created a $20 million credit when it came to this COVID. Uh, and it's called the DDI, or the Diagnostic uh, uh, Development Initiative, where we provided these credits for researchers, for healthcare providers to find and assist with a lot of the diagnosis and a lot of those tests that are, are a little bit out in shortage, if you will, in the marketplace. Um, as a result, one of the grantees or the recipients of the grants, University of British Columbia, alongside teaming with the Vancouver Health of the Hospital and a research institute there, got together to really take a look at how do I take the data that I'm receiving from a lot of the patients that are coming in, see if not that they are, are COVID positive, but how, uh, we'll call it, how impactful is that COVID? How serious is that COVID? So do they need to go home? or do they need to be hospitalized or on a ventilator system? So they created that using machine learning, something called SageMaker that we have, a product that we have, that allows for less technical people to use, manipulate, reuse algorithms in order to get a lot of the outputs that they're looking. So uh, that's going very well and really trying to innovate well beyond just some of the teaching and learning, but also take a look at the actual machine learning and allow for faster information to be processed with larger sets of data. Great. Anybody else have anything they want to say on the, uh, on the AI front? I'll echo that what Michael said around collecting data is so important in order to build AI models. And I, th I think we've seen two engagements with AI. The first is a lot of people, particularly with COVID as well, I'm seeing a lot of chatbots. And I think there's a tremendous amount of potential here. We've seen Penn State doing uh, advising chatbots using AI. We've seen Strayer, now SEI, using financial aid chatbots. I think getting information to people is so important and using AI to help improve the quality and personalize that. And the second component, I think of where we're going is, as many of you probably use Google search, when you start to type something in, it will start to recommend what it thinks you're going to type. I could see that being so powerful in education where a student is working on a project or a math problem. And they're getting to a point where they don't know exactly the next step. And if there's some sort of recommendation where it starts to provide, hey, we think this is what you might be going down towards, or here's the issue you're probably running into. And that's gonna be AI powered. So I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity around personalization as we continue to build out the market. Anything more? So I wanna move on. So looking at, you know, when you look at Coursera, what's, what's, what's fascinating to me is part of the 190 universities around the world, um, you've got now 56 million learners on the platform. But if you look at the five top or six top courses, three of them are actually from industry. So you've got Google IT automation is number one, IBM data science is number three, Google IT support rank number six, which is uh, remarkable. I don't know if you saw the Scott Galloway article, the NYU professor who talked about these potential partnerships between technology companies and universities creating programs. I don't know if anybody has a perspective on that. I see Stephen kind of shaking his head. So I don't know if you have anything to comment, but I think it's, do you think that's part of the future world of, of, of digital learning? Yeah, it was interesting too to see some of the pairings they had. I think it was Google, MIT. I read Scott's article as well. Um, and I do think what it is great about that is pairing, and the, the last panel as well was talking about pairing partnerships between universities and employers. And that partnership, I think, is really important. And Google has really been thinking about lifelong learning. And I think the previous panel was talking about smaller credentials, smaller courses. And I do believe the IT professional certificate that we launched, the whole idea was you might have someone that went to school 20 years ago, they're thinking about a switch, as opposed to going and getting a whole nother degree, how could you provide a certificate, which then is recognized by employers and they could find and make a career pivot. I'm interested in the idea. I think one thing we just have to be very careful of is those sorts of, if you really start to build a degree around it, you need to make sure that the skills are transferable and it's not a Google MIT only focused on Google tools. I think we have to think about broader skill sets and ensuring that really is a, a transferable uh, program. 
Yeah, Michael, I, uh, I go back to the last panel and, and there was some discussion about stackable credentials and an open ecosystem of learning. And I think that's how we look at it. I don't see uh, an IBM university pairing as much as a broader ecosystem and the, and, and the ability to partner across that. Um, we've been a leader in issuing badges around IT pathways. And uh, for example, we have a partnership with Northeastern. You can take a bundle of IBM badges now to Northeastern University and uh, get college credit for those. And so this idea of credit transfer and articulation needs to happen broadly across the entire industry. Uh, so for years I've been involved with the Business Higher Ed Forum. Um, it's a coalition of university presidents and, and corporate executives that have been trying to build linkages between education and workforce. So we've really gotten uh, a methodology to build digital credentials. Um, we've got a lot of pairings then and partnerships across universities uh, and employers to build these kind of digital pathways. Uh, and I think the future of education really is going to be built around this. Uh, we've launched a, a project around interoperable learner records uh, to build a blockchain network. We're uh, uh, primarily working with National Student Clearinghouse and a, a set of other leading organizations to build that kind of open standards-based framework for the ability to exchange credentials. And I think the future is going to be uh, really uh, of education will be transformed by this idea of uh, stackable credentials. It's gonna change the, the nature of education uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's what's gonna enable lifelong learning because uh, you know we no longer have this uh, learn and then earn paradigm. We've got uh, much more of a revolving door between education providers and the workforce. And the only way we're gonna facilitate all of that is to bring everyone together into an open ecosystem around some basic credential standards. And so that's the way I see us partnering with the marketplace going forward. Yeah, I'm gonna to come to you in a second because I, I want to talk about LinkedIn. I want to talk about credentials, but Jessica, talk about Unity in terms of how you think about, I mean, the brand, of, I mean, obviously a gigantic footprint in the gaming world. Um, and and I know you're training a lot of a lot of people around the world. How do you think about Unity as an education brand and and kind of the future of of, of that? And, and uh, I did I want to answer that while also building on Michael's comments. I think all of us have really similar models. Uh, we've partnered closely with universities. The professors and instructors are some of our best subject matter experts and instructional designers in creating the stackable credentials and the certifications. And where we see an opportunity, and I'll just give a little anecdote on this, is how do we better bring our customers and employers to the table in those partnerships? Um, we did a partnership uh, with the country of Senegal in Western Africa where we wanted to basically create a unique unity ecosystem that was more culturally relevant to Western African interactive experiences. And a key part of that partnership, in addition to the stackable credentials and the partnership with the universities, is how do we actually get the employers in Western Africa to be opening up the right entry level jobs for the graduates, not just of the universities, but the alternative pathways too. Yeah. So it's just four years ago. Sorry, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think I, I, it's just, it's always incredible to hear all the great things that are happening. Uh, and that the one thing I'd also like to add in there is, for sure, online learning is going to be an incredible way to scale. Um, the other approach that we also see that's been somewhat successful through partnerships has been actually about dual credit. Uh, just especially with COVID, there's a lot of parents, probably a lot of folks listening to this uh, panel session. Uh, especially uh, with, with ones with children, many of the, there's a feeling that there's been a lost semester and the summer is not too far away. So what are we gonna have for this next six months of true learning uh, and really getting that? So one of the components that we launched with Northern Virginia Community College was to actually provide the actual <laughs> AWS dual credit that was jointly created with Northern Virginia Community College and the government or the policymakers, their workforce, the governor, allowed for all those students, 75,000, 70,000 of them, to actually receive credit. It's not just about AWS, but English, history, there are other basic things there so that many of these students could continue to progress and the, the actual community college was gonna pay that with a lot of the funding that will be coming through. So we just thought that that was very interesting that yet we could do online, but many folks, the credentials important, but still the credits are also important for a lot of the high schoolers to make sure that they achieve those. And that was some interesting things. 
the other part is um, hands-on learning. Um, even though we're in a COVID, uh, learning the content is one thing, but I'll say that uh, our friend at Cal Poly, President uh, Jeff Armstrong always talks about learn by doing. And so can we do that virtually? Those are the conversations we're having, but that innovation center that we installed at Cal Poly and at ASU, just to give a little bit of pandering shout out to Dr. Crow and the team there, um, have been incredible leaders to innovate what they learn, not just take the certification and get a job, but really learn, apply real knowledge to that. So when they come out, it's not just about an, just a learning, taking an examination, but rather actually having artifacts and, and real projects out there. Wow. So Anthony, um, I can't believe it's been four years, but four years ago, Microsoft purchased LinkedIn a year before $26 billion. Um, the year before that, LinkedIn had bought Linda for $1.5 billion. How do you see that whole, I mean, the, the conceptual opportunity for this ecosystem coming together was always fascinating. It, it kind of appears like it, it, it all is. How do, you, how, how do you see LinkedIn as a platform going forward for, for the workforce and learning and, and, and what are the kind of key, key things that you're focused on today with that? Yeah, I certainly think that there's a lot of insight that we're providing to companies with uh, with the data graph from LinkedIn, and that's something that is used by many of the companies on this call. Um, the reality is we are creating a pathway for people to connect their skills to jobs, which is going to be uh, more important now than it frankly has ever been. Um, we also want to create an opportunity to learn where new skills can be applied, where you can align your talents to, to the workplace, as well as identify where um, your um, talents need uh, to be uh, built up. This is one of the things we often talk about as sort of a, a frankly overused cliche that the jobs of the future haven't been invented yet. And that's a, a, a fairly big challenge that we're giving to educators where they're uh, not able to easily identify the types of career shifts that are happening in the market. So we can do that with LinkedIn where the students can get insight of where they need to uh, you know, in, in, incre increase their skilling uh, to align to job growth, as well as make sure that they're connecting to available employers. Uh, that's something that we're, we're embracing across the company. It's certainly gonna be our mission to not only help get future generations of learners to employment, but to help reskill and upskill existing uh, folks that have been displaced from work. And so LinkedIn is gonna be a key part of that work for us, as well as GitHub to provide this collaboration of an open community to share and build their tech skills uh, uh, through technology. So those are the things that I think we're leaning on, but you know, there are many other tools for job placement and job skills, but we're working on uh, both integrating Microsoft's core learning platform, which is Microsoft Learn, which provides Microsoft skilling with LinkedIn Learning, which provides a broader range of skills that are needed by learners uh, to get ready for the future. So we just have barely over five minutes left and there's a number of things I'd like to get your thoughts on. So I, I'm gonna ask uh, if we can even keep it tighter just to get some reactions because I think it's, um, I, I really like to hear your views on some things. First, just in some technologies, voice enabled technologies. What do we think the future of that is for learning? Um, and uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Alexa, let me, let me hear kind of the, the AWS perspective of, of that first. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, I, and I, I apologize, I even forgot the entire machine learning with even Alexa, and I always have to turn the Alexa off when I'm speaking uh, about uh, the technology. Uh, it's definitely one of the more exciting uh, areas. Uh, we actually invested already some time well ahead of even this COVID to truly take a look at how we can leverage a lot of the power of how to communicate with the educators or the school information back to the parents, just some basic things like that. So we actually have already, as many of you know, hundreds of millions of these devices already in the homes. And we really wanted to find a way to keep it simple, whether there's a skill that we can create uh, that allows for all that interoperability of that information for somebody to just voice activate and get those answers relatively quickly. So we created a skill that connects to the variety of all the largest learning management systems, student information systems. So now parents can really go, Alexa, are there any updates from school? Or Alexa, what assignments does Rosario have to do, do, do tomorrow? Or when is the next examination? Basic things like that that would take 
sometimes minutes, if not hours, for folks to find can just do that in the comfort of their home. Um, additionally, what's exciting about that is that we not only got a tremendous amount of interest, we also created during this COVID example where the communication needed to become a lot more automated. I think uh, the other gentleman from Google mentioned about call centers. We saw an incredible uptick of that. And now we have created a Q&A chatbot where educators or someone like myself, non-technical, uh, can actually create questions and allow that to be answered. And that was extremely important for school closings, COVID updates, and a variety of other things. So uh, I'll pause there, Michael, just respecting your time. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments on the voice enabled opportunity? I think it, it, it creates a great opportunity for different types of learning. And, you know, for example, if you have a student who's dyslexic, as opposed to opening up a, a encyclopedia, they now have another opportunity to engage and learn. I think the one piece of advice I'd have is how do we ensure that we keep the voice uh, siloed from just a specific type of hardware? So ensuring that that voice learning can happen over multiple types of devices, I think is really important. So I'm going to give you one word, uh, hype, overhyped, about right or under hype, a few different technologies. I like everybody's perspective. I'm gonna go around the horse start with Jessica. 5G. That's right. <laughs> Michael. Just right. Anthony. Yes, right. Steven. Potentially under hyped. Okay. I'm with you. Andrew? We're waiting for it. It's good. <laughs> Virtual reality, augmented reality. Jessica. Of course, totally under hyped. Okay. Michael. Under hype. Anthony. Under hype for, for a, AR and maybe over hype for VR. Okay, good. Steven. Say just right. Andrew. Under hype. Okay. Blockchain. Jessica. Over hype. Over hype. Michael. Under hype. I'm with you. Anthony. Under hype. Okay. Steven. I'm gonna go just right, take the middle course there. <laughs> I would say uh, I'll take the middle road as well. Okay, that's awesome. Recognizing we just have two minutes left, so this has to be a tight answer. If you were to predict what's gonna be the most different about the education sector in 2030, what would you say? And I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give the first, uh, Andrew, since you yeah. shake your head, I'm going to give you I'll the first. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I'd say beyond technology, um, I think there's going to be a lot of questions around seat time versus uh, competency uh, and how funding works uh, according there, especially for places like the U.S. I think there's going to be a tremendous more of demands of what you learn to apply it to an occupation uh, and the credentialing for sure are one of those particular areas. Uh, the other area is financing. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, debt uh, in the U.S., uh, and there's going to be a lot of questions of the value uh, of a lot of those particular types of uh, degrees that are going to be received. So those are probably the future of things, the questions, big questions that need to be addressed by that. Time. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, we're going to see a, a real transformation of the industry around the individual and tools like credentials and competency-based assessments and the ability to move that individual across providers and through the system is going to have a profound impact on the overall education training marketplace. And it's going to be underway by 2030. I'm not sure we'll see it complete by then. Steven. I think it's around analytics and much more data-driven decisions, less solid analytics, more integration, and that's going to be key to things like artificial intelligence. Jessica. I think it'll be viewed less as a sector and more as a leading indicator for the valuation of companies based on what the talent is of their existing base and their future base. Anthony, you get the last word. Yeah, certainly I'll build on everything everyone has said. I agree with all of it. Um, more blended, uh, certainly more purposeful in terms of students getting skills they need for doing, making, and, and careers, uh, and more um, personalized in terms of using data to individualize experiences uh, and of course more lifelong that the notion of reskilling will, will uh, permeate every industry and that will be something that the education system will need to respond to uh, much more than just corporate learning environments today. Perfect. Thank you so much. It was an awesome panel. Um, a lot of fun. You guys were terrific. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Be safe.
All right, well now we're gonna, for, for cleanup here, um, it's, it's my privilege to introduce our, uh, our, our final uh, visit with um, uh, former governor of Florida and our friend Jeb Bush, and then um, my partner, uh, Deborah Quaza, who is um, bravely playing off the injured reserve list and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think ready to, to roll with her interview with, with, with Governor Bush. So Deborah, take it away. Deborah, you there? Sorry, got off mute. That's the standard Zoom problem. Um, Jeb, it's, still, it's wonderful to be with you. Hold on one second, let me get my one obstacle out of the way. Um, I, I couldn't be there in my home state of Florida with you, so uh, I brought my, my mother's Jacksonville, Florida garden behind me. Um, so you'll See, appreciate beautiful. The, St. John, the St. John's River in the background. Um, anyway, it's, it, we're, we're delighted to have you here today on our really last, last session of our April um, series uh, um, today. So obviously, incredibly successful two-term Florida governor. You are education first in your in your work as governor of Florida, um, and it's an area that you re remain you know very mission and passion driven around uh, with Excel and Ed and other things that you do. I I thought can we, let's start with the pandemic because uh, I'd like to kind of get your 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 thinking your comment on that um, and the the pandemic driven experiment with remote learning. Uh, today, the Wall Street Journal had a headline that said some school districts are planning to end the you know the year early, calling remote learning too tough. Um, and then we had 40% of district leaders were polled and they said they could not support in-home learning even for a day. Um, so I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Is this a pass or a fail? What, what have we learned? How do we improve this? Um, you know, what were your lessons from, from Florida? Well, um, thanks for having me, Deborah. Um, I hope you're recovering from your injury. I um, much better. It's, uh, the pandemic is a game changer, and a lot of times when you have a crisis like this, it creates the opportunity to make more transformational change, and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, monopolies in general are, are the most, most resistant to that kind of change, but um, the record is mixed for sure. You have 13,000 school districts. Some of them, based on a political decision, said if we can't provide access to um, learning via the internet, uh, we're not going to, to everyone, we're not going to provide it to anyone. Others couldn't do it technically, you know, they just, they just weren't prepared. They didn't do the training necessary. And others flourished and did really well. Um, and so I, I would start by saying that all school districts need to learn this as uh, the lessons learned of success and, and failure and improve because distance learning is going to be part of the strategy to open up the schools. If, if we're going to socially distance in classrooms and people are talking about 10 feet between desks, I mean, you think about middle school with 10 feet difference, you're going to have to have a split arrangement where maybe Mondays and Wednesdays uh, kids come to school and Tuesdays and Thursdays a separate cadre of kids come to school. And on Friday, there's online learning. There's going to be lots of different approaches. All of them are going to include online learning. And I think parents having gone through this experience, most of which has been pretty traumatic, um, are gonna wanna have a, a better uh, sense of how, this, how they can help their children learn. Um, and so the opportunity would be, there's all sorts of, you know, the last panel is the answer in so many ways to listen to them talk about things. There's huge opportunities for us to get this right. And the final thing I'd say is, uh, there will be a huge outcry already started that we need to bail out the schools. We need to bail out education budgets. There will be shortfalls and there's and the federal government has already provided a pretty healthy slug of money. I would argue for making the first dollar spent be the ones that deal with this issue rather than to backfill deficits, use the money to reform, to fix the things that will make learning, um, you know, move to a 21st century model. And so, We'll see. I mean, Excel and Ed is working hard to encourage commissioners of education and governors to be bigger and bolder at this time rather than play defense. And um, we're hopeful that many states will do that. So, Jeff, I think, and further, I think to that, I mean, you know, remote learning is a term everyone's using. And it's interesting to me, it's kind of code for a couple things. One is it's home learning. So what hit, what this, these um, successes and failures have underscored is that we are, 
um, for, for the preponderance of low-income students that don't have devices and don't have bandwidth at home, they're missing the opportunity to learn at home. It's not just, it's not really remote, it's really almost the wrong word. And because, you know, home or a different place than school is where most students and children spend their days. And so have you been, I mean, what do you think about how we, um, you know, from a government, from whether it's federal government, state government, you know, local, how do we solve what is clearly an issue that our students are not just ill-equipped to, to move into a remote learning environment, but on a day-to-day -day basis, low-income students are not given, getting the same opportunity to learn digitally anyway, if digital is the future, which I, you know, I believe it is, um, at home. So yeah, what do you I, think about? Yeah. Well, first, I, I think we should get the, the right data points. Um, a majority of people in this country can access learning from the home, a majority of low-income uh, students, but there is a gap, without a doubt. Uh, we spend billions of dollars in E-rate. We spend billions of dollars in technology budgets. A lot of it is vendor driven. No disrespect to the large ed tech companies that go, traipse around the country selling stuff, software and, and equipment. Uh, maybe we should create a national strategy that's implemented locally uh, to deal with this one pressing problem that once we get fixed, uh, could be a long-term investment of great benefit. And so I, I would argue that if there is to be an infrastructure fund, this should be the highest priority, that we ought to reallocate monies, whether it's in the E-rate program, if that's possible to do, or other means to be able to, to deal with this digital divide. It's been talked about now for how long? 15, 20 years. Yep. And, and now's the chance, I think, the opportunity to, to fix it. And then the question is, are teachers, they need to be trained to teach in, in, this, uh, in this new format. And parents need to be totally engaged to be able to enhance the learning. Deborah, I'd add one other thought, and that is maybe we get to the point where the learning is flipped, where the teacher actually, um, the homework is what's done in the classroom and the, and the, um, uh, the learning is done at home and the teacher then can be a coach for the students to make sure that they've actually mas mastered the material. Um, that would be, you could do that if you, if you eliminated the digital divide. I, I think that's right. I mean, you even see with Khan Academy, in fact, that's what, you know, saw a lot, in a lot of the um, usage that's with Khan Academy early on was, it, you know, both teachers learning at home and students learning at home. And then, yeah, yeah no, I, I, cause I also think there's a question of if we're not equipped to do remote learning in K-12 and, and one of the earlier panels talked about of the, the incredible demand for online solutions for working adults. Um, so if we're not equipping, you know, K-12 students to be online, you know, digital learners, then we're, we're probably not equipping them for the modern workforce. And that, you know, that seems to be a, a, an issue of global competitiveness. Uh, you know, I don't know what you think about that, but. Yeah. All I can tell you is uh, the after action report will be full of phenomenally great examples. Miami-Dade County, my home, my home school district, the fourth largest in the United States. I think everybody here is learning remotely and it's been effective and they trained for it. Uh, and they, they made it a high priority prior to the virus to make this part of the education experience. And then Fairfax County, the IT head of the IT department just got fired because they couldn't deliver. I mean, literally, and Fairfax spends a lot more than Miami-Dade per student. So uh, I, I just would argue that we need to take the best practices and apply them. Uh, and teacher development needs to shift to, towards this area as well, because teachers are overwhelmed. I mean, it's a, this is an extraordinarily difficult challenge okay. and, and they need to be, they need, they need backup. Yep. Well, I think the, I think one of the silver linings here is there's also been an incredible groundswell of appreciation for great teachers um, from all the parents who are now at home trying to, um, fortunately my children are too old for that. So I've just had to watch all my, uh, my partners um, work through with their young, with their younger yeah, children. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard <laughs> that fifth grade math is really hard. <laughs> but I do, I do hope that also one of the silver linings here is that there is a, is a groundswell of appreciation for teacher, you know, the great teachers out there working um, they're, they're themselves to death to try to you know, do YouTube you know, to engage students in, the, in this new environment. But I do, it, it, your, your comment on Miami-Dade, you know, leads me to kind of a question on general leadership and leadership in a crisis. I think that, you know, Miami-Dade's had, you know, arguably terrific, long-standing, strong leadership of its school system. Um, and I, so I just 
what do you think about um, the role of leadership? Can we, how to, and, and I guess the other comment I would make is that you can actually, there was some, I was reading statistics yesterday on China and their Ministry of Education basically launched 22 online course platforms during, during the pandemic, which had supported 24,000 courses. So they basically sent a national, um, and I know that we're, we're uh, you know, adamantly against national, you know, national uh, control of education for a whole, you know, variety of good reasons, but how do we scale district, you know, great leadership at the district level into a national, um, a national phenomenon like what, what they've seen in China, um, which were, were arguably their pandemic move to online learning was very successful. Um, anyway, just love to get your, your, your thinking on, on well, that. Leadership matters on good days. It really matters during pandemics and disasters and crises. And um, the first the first type, the kind of leadership we need now is the servant leadership. It's humble, it's fact-based, it's, it's telling people the truth, but giving them hope. It's connecting with them on a human level, showing empathy. I mean, this is a very dangerous, difficult time. State budgets, uh, the pension obligations are, are now gonna become um, a bigger part of the, of the budget because We've had shortfalls and that'll hurt, that'll hurt the here and now spending. Uh, pension obligations remain the same. Uh, Catholic, the private, universe, the private schools that provide so much support, 10% of all students go to private schools. Well, if people have lost their income, they're probably not gonna be as uh, anxious to spend money on private tuition. Um, the corporate tax scholarship in Florida uh, works when you have corporate taxes to credit. If there's no corporate taxes, you'll see a reduction in what the largest uh, school choice program, private school choice program in the country. So in moments like this, you wanna be, you wanna tell people the truth, you wanna give them um, hope, and you wanna connect with them in an empathetic way, and then take advantage of the challenge to turn it into a huge opportunity. And, and so that's, that's uh, Carvalho here in Miami-Dade, I think is a great example of that, and many others are as well. None of this is gonna change unless parents and community leaders say enough of this. Uh, without, without parental engagement, um, government run monopolies just don't go quietly in the night. I know that's politically incorrect and I apologize for those that may not sense that that's uh, the way you're supposed to be talking these days, but they don't. They don't change unless there is pressure and without parent involvement, I don't see that happening naturally. Um, in the private sector and in the philanthropic world, uh, in the not-for-profit world, change happens quicker because there's, a, there's an imperative to make things uh, better. If you don't, you may not survive. Governments are the last entities that uh, will make that change and, and people will have to demand it. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, you've, you, you've obviously spent um, significant energy and, and um, to the K-12 system, but, but you know, we're gonna see, um, coming out of this, I think there are also, I mean, obviously there's going to be enormous pressure and some of the earlier panels talked about, I mean, incredible pressure on the higher education system. And we've already got the issue of declining enrollments and economic um, stresses. And I think we will, we're already beginning to see state budget wax at the, um, at, at, at higher ed, you know, higher ed allocations. So what do you, what do you think about, and then you guys have been very involved in the dual enroll and dual enrollment's been a big issue for you all, which I believe is one of those important linking bridges between K-12 and higher ed. So any reflections on what you think coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, will be potentially positive catalysts in higher education and, and, um, this, this is a, you know, the walls were closing in on public universities and private, um, except for the, the fanciest ones yep. prior to the uh, pandemic. And this will only accelerate it. So um, K-12 will get a lot of its money back, if not all. We'll see how the Congress appropriates money. Higher ed won't. Um, and so you have rising student debt, recourse debt on the backs of students, uh, you can't continue to raise tuition. And so the, the schools that educate 90% of all the students, uh, most of whom are not 19 year olds, most of whom are right. either going back to, to get a degree of relevance for their lives or they're trying to complete a degree. Um, that's, that's where the, the, the danger is. And I think there needs to be a lot of philanthropy and a lot of 
state support for these universities, but along with it, there should be reforms. We should not call a four-year degree four years unless a student has the capability of actually graduating in four years. And in many places, they can't do that. Online learning is another place where there's all sorts of innovations taking place in the university space, and that, that should continue to accelerate. There are places in the United States so that prohibit that. States with large number of students that aspire to a better life, California being one of them, New York, where the barriers of entry, sadly to say, I think Illinois may be on that list, um, where the, the barriers of entry of innovation are, 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 um, are there and they're, they're real. So hopefully out of this, there will be continued support through state governments and federal government, of course, but, but I think along with that, there should be significant reforms. It, and then as it relates to dual enrollment, of course, we should be expanding these things. 25% of all juniors are capable of taking right. college level work and only three or 4% do. Who's fooling who here? I mean, this, this customizing the learning experience to make sure kids that are struggling aren't just pushed along and kids that could learn at a faster rate aren't held back has got to be the great imperative for K-12 education and higher education going forward. Well, and it also pulls some of the high, to your point, since, you know, the K-12 system is less economically vulnerable, arguably, it pulls some of that, you know, some of that economics into the high school. That's that right. Might have been spent in, in higher ed, which I think is also really important. Um, let me ask you a question about political will. Uh, you know, I think that all of us, or at least, at least I'll speak for myself, um, are pretty ena enamored with Dr. Fauci. Um, we, uh, you know, you we hang Brad Pitt? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Brad Pitt and Dr. Fauci, um, the Brad Pitt of, of healthcare. He, um, you know, we hang on every word. His, he, he's admired and 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 speaks the truth. Um, and the and certainly the COVID, the pandemic has been, you know, a, a tragedy on on a thousand different levels. But the reality is, you know, we still have, despite rising graduation rates high school graduation rates here in Chicago, we've seen a precipitous increase um, in graduation. We still have, a mil you know, 1.2 million students still drop out of high school every year, which is just a, you know, a stunning number when you, you know, you, you correlate that to, to health, to health care issues, whether it's COVID or anything else. Um, and when do you think we'll have the political will to, uh, for, for the country, the culture, the you know, federal government, the, the whatever, um, to, to take these issues as seriously um, as if they were a human health issue? Because they absolutely are. So I'm just curious when you think, when you think that, will, and, and then also comment on this presidential Race, not necessarily the final race, but I mean, even coming up to this race, I never felt that there was an adequate discussion of education as an issue, except for the free college thing. Um, yeah, I don't even think in any of the debates an education question came up in the Democratic nope. debates, and, and in 16, a similar kind of situation. Part of that is the dichotomy that K-12 education, at least, is locally administered. Policies are created at the state level. The federal government plays a supportive when they're doing it right and you know they're marginal at best i mean 10 percent of the funding comes from the federal government so um i think part of this will be we have to change the political environment where um, taking risks is re are rewarded again we're reaching out across the aisle is rewarded i mean every big initiative that i got to do uh, or tried to do uh, the first impulse was, let me find a Democrat that doesn't look like me to be my, my, my partner in this. Now, if you do that, and I, I see it on you know, my Twitter feed, when you, when you like, advocate something like that, you're a, a rhino if you're a Republican. I don't know what you are if, if you're a Democrat that would dare do it, because very few do. Right. Uh, so there needs to be, people can decide if, if, if they want to change the political culture, because it's, it's who we are. Um, if they want to change it, then they reward politicians that are trying to advance the cause of reform in a more uh, bipartisan way. And education would be a great place to do it. I'm not, um, I'm a, I, I believe the United States is best when we're a bottom-up country. So when, you know, China does something great, that's fine. That's, that's, that's the Chinese way. America at its best, there's someone in a garage right now that is going to do something that he won't be or she won't be able to explain to me because it'll be way over my head, but it's gonna change the world. And it's more likely to happen in this environment than it would if everybody was content. So I'm an optimist about how we change this, but 
our political culture is is us. It's not some extraneous thing. It's we're it's a circus mirror, but it's a mirror of who we are. And if we're going to be vulgar, and if we're going to attack each other, and if we're going to um, not try to solve problems, but push people people down to look make ourselves look better, if that's if that's who we are, then we shouldn't be surprised we have a political system that that mirrors that. Perfect. Wonderful. Wonderful comment. I think that's actually a perfect way we're ending on the nose. That is, um, if, if you have any last sort of optimism coming out of, into the AD, it's like we, we like to call it the AD world after disease, um, having gone from BC uh, before Corona. Um, any, any, last, any last thoughts? You know what? Just tell mom she's got a beautiful garden. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jeb, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I, uh, I'm with you on the political point and I hope we can all join together and, um, and find a Dr. Fauci for education and, uh, and get, get those issues to the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, thank you guys so much, appreciate it. Thank you, thanks. All right, and with that, I think um, we're just going to, as I think Michael, my partner Michael mentioned earlier, uh, tomorrow we have a final special session actually at four o'clock Pacific, so a different time. A fireside chat between uh, Michael Moe and President Crow from Arizona State. Um, Crow knows what's next for America's most innovative university. Otherwise, we really appreciate everyone for joining us over the, this month. We will um, have a shortened schedule, most likely in May, maybe uh, uh, two sessions. Um, on Wednesdays and we'll, we'll be back out with that shortly and hopefully, hopefully after that we'll be in, fully into a, an AD world. But um, thanks everyone for joining us and have a great rest of the week.